Thoughts on the Revival of Religion in New England, 1740, to which is prefixed a narrative of the surprising work of God in Northampton, Massachusetts, 1735, by Jonathan Edwards. This is chapter 27, being read by Peter John Parises, also known as Brian Dean. Chapter 27, Wrong Principles, Incorrect Views of an at testation of providence undervaluing external order. Another error that is of the nature of an erroneous principle into which some have fallen is a wrong notion that they have of an attestation of divine providence to persons or things. We go too far when we look upon the success that God gives to some persons in making them the instruments of doing much good as a testimony of God's approbation of those persons and all the courses they take. It is a main argument that has been made use of to defend the conduct of some of those ministers that have been blamed as imprudent and irregular, that God has smiled upon them and blessed them and given them great success, and that however men charge them as guilty of many wrong things, yet it is evident that God is with them, and then who can be against them? And probably some of those ministers themselves, by this very means, have had their ears stopped against all that has been said to convince them of their misconduct. But there are innumerable ways that persons may be misled in forming a judgment of the mind and will of God from the evidence of providence. If a person's success be a reward of something that God sees in him that he approves of, yet it is no argument that he approves of everything in him, who can tell how far divine grace may go in greatly rewarding some small good that he sees in a person, a good meaning, something good in his disposition, while he at the same time, in sovereign mercy, hides his eyes from a great deal that is bad, that it is a pleasure to forgive and not to mark against the person, though in itself it be very ill? God has not told us after what manner he will proceed in this matter, and we go upon most uncertain grounds when we undertake to determine. It is an exceedingly difficult thing to know how far love or hatred is exercised towards persons or actions by all that is before us, God was pleased in his sovereignty to give such success to Jacob in what from beginning to end was a deceitful line contrivancy and proceeding that in that way he obtained the blessing that was worth infinitely more than the fatness of the earth and the dew of heaven which was given to Esau in his blessing, yea, worth more than all that the world can afford. God was for a while with Judas so that he, by God's power accompanying him, wrought miracles and cast out devils. But this could not justly be interpreted as God's approbation of his person or the theft that he practiced at the same time. The dispensations and events of providence with their reasons are too little understood by us to be improved by us as our rule instead of God's word. God has his way in the sea and his path in the mighty waters, and his footsteps are not known, and he gives us no account of any of his matters. And therefore, we cannot safely take the events of his providence as a revelation of his mind concerning a person's conduct and behavior. We have no warrant so to do. God has never appointed those things, but something else to be our rule. We have but one rule to go by, and that is his holy word. And when we join anything else with it, as having the force of a rule, we are guilty of that, which is strictly forbidden. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2, Proverbs 30, verse 6, Revelation 22, verse 18. They who make what they imagine is pointed forth to them in providence, their rule of behavior, do err, as well as those that follow impulses and impressions. We should put nothing in the room of the word of God. It is to be feared that some have been greatly confirmed and emboldened by the great success that God has given them in some things 
that have really been contrary to the rule, rules of God's holy word. If it has been so, they have been guilty of presumption and abusing God's kindness to them and the great honor he has put upon them. They have seen that God was with them and made them victorious in their preaching. And this it is to be feared that has been abused by some to a degree of self-confidence. It has prevented a proper jealousy of themselves. They have been bold, therefore, to go great lengths in a presumption that God was with them and would defend them and finally baffle all that found fault with them. Indeed, there is a voice of God in his providence that may be interpreted and well understood by the rule of his word, and providence may, to our dark minds and weak faith, confirm the word of God as it fulfills it. But to improve divine providence thus is quite a different thing from making a rule of providence. A good use may be made of the evidence of providence or our own observation and experience and human histories and the opinion of the fathers and other eminent men. But finally, all must be brought to one rule, the word of God, and that must be regarded as our only rule. Nor do I think that they go upon sure ground that conclude that they have not been in an error in their conduct, because at the time of their doing a thing for which they have been blamed and reproached by others, they were favored with special comforts of God's spirit. God's bestowing special spiritual mercies on a person at such a time is no sign that he approves of everything that he then sees in him. David had very much of the presence of God while he lived in polygamy, and Solomon had some very high favors and peculiar smiles of heaven, in particular at the dedication of the temple, while he greatly multiplied wives to himself and horses and silver and gold. On contrary to the most expressed command of God to the king in the law of Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 16 and 17. We cannot tell how far God may hide his eyes from beholding iniquity in Jacob and seeing perverseness in Israel. We cannot tell what are the reasons of God's actions any further than he interprets for himself. God sometimes gave some of the primitive Christians the extraordinary influence of his spirit when they were out of the way of their duty and continued it while they were abusing it, as is plainly implied, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 31 through 33. Yea, if a person has done a thing for which he is reproached, and that reproach be an occasion of his feeling sweet exercises of grace in his soul, and that from time to time, I do not think that is a certain evidence that God approves of the thing he is blamed for. For undoubtedly a mistake may be the occasion of stirring up the exercise of grace in a man that has grace. If a person, through a mistake, thinks he has received some particular great mercy, that mistake may be the occasion of stirring up the sweet exercises of love to God and true thankfulness and joy in God. As, for instance, if one that is full of love to God should hear credible tidings concerning a remarkable deliverance of a child or other dear friend or some glorious thing done for the city of God, no wonder if, on such an occasion, the sweet actings of love to God and delight in God should be excited, though indeed afterwards it should prove a false report that he heard. So if one that loves God is much maligned in reproach for doing that which he thinks God required and approves, no wonder that it is sweet to such a one to think that God is his friend, though men are his enemies. No wonder at all that this is an occasion of his, as it were, leaving the world and sweetly betaking himself to God as a sure friend and finding sweet complacency in God, though he be indeed in a mistake, concerning that which he thought was agreeable to God's will. As I have before shown that the exercise of a truly good affection may be the occasion of error and may indirectly incline a person to do that which is wrong, so on the other hand, error or a doing that which is wrong may be an occasion of the exercise of a truly good affection. The reason is that however all exercises of grace be from the Spirit of God, yet the Spirit of God dwells and acts in the heart of the saints, in some measure after the manner of a vital natural principle, a principle of new nature in them, whose exercises are excited by means in some measure as other natural principles are. Though grace be not in the saints as a mere natural principle, 
but as a sovereign agent. And so its exercises are not tied to means by an immutable law of nature, as in mere natural principles. Yet God has so constituted that grace should so dwell in the hearts of the saints that its exercises should have some degree of connection with means after the manner of a principle of nature. Another erroneous principle that there has been something of and that has been an occasion of some mischief and confusion is that external order in matters of religion and the use of the means of grace is but little to be regarded. It is spoken lightly of under the names of ceremonies and dead forms, etc., and is probably the more despised by some because their oppressors insist so much upon it, and because they are so continually hearing from them the cry of disorder and confusion. It is objected against the importance of external order that God does not look at the outward form, he looks at the heart. But it is a weak argument against its importance that true godliness does not consist in it, for it may be equally made use of against all the outward means of grace whatsoever. True godliness does not consist in ink and paper, but yet that would be a foolish objection against the importance of ink and paper in religion, when without it we could not have the word of God. If any external means are at all needful, any outward actions of a public nature or wherein God's people are jointly concerned in public society, without doubt external order is needful. The management of an external affair that is public or wherein a multitude is concerned without order is in everything found impossible. Without order there can be no general direction of a multitude to any particular designed end. Their purposes will cross one another and they will not help but hinder one another. A multitude cannot set in union one with another without order. Confusion separates and divides them so that they can be no concert or agreement. If a multitude would help one another in any affair, they must unite themselves one to another in a regular subordination of members in some measure as it is in the natural body. By this means, they will be in some capacity to act with united strength. And thus Christ has appointed that it should be in the visible church, as 1 Corinthians 12, verses 14 through 31, and Romans 12, verse 4 through 8. Zeal without order will do but little, or at least it will be effectual but a little while. Let a company that are very zealous against the enemy go forth to war without any manner of order, everyone rushing forward as his zeal shall drive him all in confusion if they gain something at the first onset by surprising the enemy, yet how soon do they come to nothing and fall in easy helpless prey to their adversaries. Order is one of the most necessary of all external means for the spiritual good of God's church, and therefore it is requisite even in heaven itself where there is the least need of any external means of grace, order is maintained among the glorious angels there. The necessity of it for carrying on any design wherein a multitude are concerned is so great that even the devils in hell are driven to something of it that they may carry on the designs of their kingdom. And it is very observable that those kinds of irrational creatures for whom it is needful that they should act in union and join a multitude together to carry on any work for their preservation, they do, by a wonderful instinct that God has put into them observe and maintain a most regular and exact order among themselves, such as bees and some others. And order in the visible church is not only necessary on carrying on the designs of God's glory and the church's prosperity, but it is absolutely necessary to its defense. Without it, it is like a city without walls and can do in no capacity to defend itself from any kind of mischief. And so, however order be an external thing, yet it is not to be despised on that account, for though it be not the food of souls, yet it is in some respect their defense. The people of Holland would be very foolish to despise the dikes that keep out the sea from overwhelming them under the names of dead stones and vile earth, because the matter of which they are built is not good to eat. It seems to be partly on the foundation of this notion 
of the worthlessness of external order that some have seem to act on the principle that the power of judging and openly censoring others should not be reserved in the hands of particular persons or consistories appointed thereto, but ought to be left at large for any that please to take it upon them or that think themselves fit for it, but more of this afterwards. On this foundation also, an orderly attending on the stated worship of God in families has been made too light of, and it has been in some places too much of a common and customary thing to be absent from family worship and to be abroad late in the night at religious meetings or to attend religious conversation. Not but that this may be on certain extraordinary occasions. I have seen the case to be such in many instances that I have thought it afforded significant uh, warrant for persons to be absent from family prayer and to be from home until very late in the night. But we should take heed that this does not become a custom or common practice. If it should be so, we shall soon find the consequences to be very ill. It seems to be on the same foundation of the supposed unprofitableness of external order that it has been thought by some that there is no need that such and such religious services and performances should be limited to any certain office in the church, of which more afterwards, and also that those offices in themselves, as particularly that of the gospel ministry, need not be limited, as it is used to be, to persons of a liberal education. But some of late have been for having others that have been supposed to be persons of eminent experience publicly licensed to preach, yea, and ordained to the work of the ministry, and some ministers have seemed to favor such a thing, but how little do they seem to look forward and consider the unavoidable consequences of opening such a door. If once it should become a custom or a thing greatly approved and allowed of to admit persons to the work of the ministry that have had no education for it because of their remarkable experiences and being persons of good understanding, but how many lay persons would soon appear as candidates for the work of the ministry? I doubt not, but that I have been acquainted with scores that would have desired it. And how shall we know where to stop? If one is admitted because his experiences are remarkable, another will think his experiences are also remarkable, and we perhaps shall not be able to deny but that they are near as great. If one is admitted because, besides experiences, he has good natural abilities, another by himself and many of his neighbors may be thought equal to him, it will be found by absolute necessity that there should be some certain visible limits fixed to avoid bringing odium upon ourselves and breeding uneasiness and strife among others. And I know of none better, and indeed no other that can well be fixed than those that the prophet Zacharias fixes, namely, that those only should be appointed to be pastors or shepherds in God's church that have been taught to keep cattle from their youth or that have had an education for that purpose. Those ministers that have a disposition to break over these limits, if they should do so and make a practice of it, would break down that fence which they themselves, after a while, after they had been wearied, with the ill consequences, we'd be glad to have somebody else build up for them. Not but that there may probably be some persons in the land that have had no education at college that are in themselves better qualified for the work of the ministry than some others that have taken their degrees and are now ordained. But yet I believe that breaking over those bounds that have hitherto been set in ordaining such persons would in its consequences be a greater calamity than the missing such persons in the work of the ministry. The opening of a door for admission of unlearned men to the work of the ministry, though they should be persons of extraordinary experience, would be some account be especially prejudiced at such a day as this, because such persons, for want of extensive knowledge, are oftentimes forward to lead others into those things which a person are in danger of at such a time above all other times, namely impulses, vain imagination, superstition, indiscreet zeal, in such like extremes, instead of defending them from them, for which a person especially need a shepherd at such an extraordinary season. Another erroneous principle that it seems to me some have been at least in danger of is that ministers, because they 
speak as Christ's ambassadors, may assume the same style and speak as with the same authority that the prophets of old did, yea, that Jesus Christ himself did in the 23rd of Matthew. Ye serpents, ye generations of vipers, etc., and other places, and that not only when they are speaking to the people, but also to their brethren in the ministry, which principle is absurd because it makes no difference in the different degrees and orders of messengers that God has sent into the world, though God has made a very great difference, for though they all come in some respect in the name of God and with something of his authority, yet certainly there is a vast difference in the degree of authority with which God has invested them. Jesus Christ was one that was sent into the world as God's messenger, and so was one of his apostles, and so also is an ordinary pre-pastor of a church. And yet, it does not follow that because Jesus Christ and an ordinary minister are both messengers of God, that therefore an ordinary minister in his office is vested with the same degree of authority that Christ was in his. As there is a great difference in the, their authority, and as Christ came as God's messenger in a vastly higher manner, so another style became him more authoritative than is proper for us worms of the dust, though we also are messengers of inferior degree. It would be strange if God, when he has made so great a difference in the degree in which he has vested, invested different messengers with his authority, should make no difference as to the outward appearance and show of authority and style and behavior which is proper and fit to be seen in them. Though God has put great honor upon ministers, and they may speak as his ambassadors, yet he never intended that they should have the same outward appearance of authority and majesty, either in their behavior or speech, that his son shall have when he comes into judgment at the last day, though both come in different respects and degrees in the name of the Lord. Alas, can anything ever make it into, enter into the heart's of worms of the dust, that it is fit and suitable that it should be so. Thus I have considered the two first of the three causes of error in conduct that are that were mentioned. End of chapter 7, kind of been read by Peter John Parisi, also known as Brian Dean. None of my audios are copyrighted. Please feel free to make as many copies as you desire to the glory of God.